is electric. Hi everyone, welcome back for another energy related video. It's Wednesday the 3rd of July. Time to give you an update on how we got on in the month of June. But before we get on to the statistics, just a quick introduction on the journey that I've been on because why am I doing all this energy stuff? Why am I updating you about how we're getting on with solar and how much energy we're consuming during the month? And it's all about the change that I embraced from 2018 onwards. It's about the change in the strategy of deciding to go electric. I wanted to be able to drive cars in my retirement and not worry about the cost of the journey. And it doesn't matter whether it's a £20 journey, a £50 journey, or a £100 journey. You only have to do a few of those a month, and it soon makes a dent into your pension. So you're spending money on energy rather than things that you enjoy doing. So I decided to go electric as in electric cars. And it's obvious, once you've got an electric car, you need solar panels. Because if you can power it from your own energy, free energy, that's even better than drawing energy from the grid. And that seems to snowball. Once you start, then I think, well, I need more solar panels, and then I want to change my heating to get rid of the oil tank that we have and the oil boiler. So we've gone with electric heating, and I want my hot water tank online and be smart and save me some energy. So we've gone with the Mixergy hot water tank. So all of those things over the last five or six years have really helped me to the point where we now don't have any energy bills. In the summer months, we have such an excess of solar energy that we can export it for a credit from the energy company, and that credit more than pays for the energy we're drawing during winter. So we have a net zero home here, net zero bills. So all of the energy for hot water, for heating, for driving our electric cars, you know, 10, 15,000 miles a year, it's all for free. And in fact, the energy company is paying us net credits. So the amount of money that I've invested in our infrastructure here in the home is now paying huge dividends, so much so that in retirement, I have energy independence, I have energy freedom, I have peace of mind, I'm not worried about the energy crisis and bills and the prices of things, and I can drive my cars wherever I want, even if I just fancy popping to a shop 100 miles away and then driving straight back. That seems an affordable thing to do because it's not costing me any money. So it's, it's a really good feeling, and that's what I want to emphasize. Going electric is not all about saving the environment from CO2. It's not just about air quality, which I actually think is a big thing when we were in COVID, etc. It's lovely to have clean air because petrol and diesel cars and vans weren't on the road. If we can get to the point where they're all electric, we'll have that cleaner air. And that I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to seeing that in my lifetime and experiencing that cleaner air. But for me, mostly it's about the freedom and independence. And that is a lot about the money because if you're not worrying about bills, not worrying about money, in fact, you've got a net credit, then that's what gives you freedom. So there you go, there's the spiel, there's the journey, there's the strategy that I would recommend to as many people as possible. Divert your money from holidays, from new mobile phones, from other things you spend money on, divert it into doing some of these electric things. You know, Bring electrification into your life. Please, though, don't buy a hybrid car. Don't buy a hybrid electric plug-in hybrid or any of those hybrids. If it's got an engine, got an exhaust, you don't want one of those. You want a fully electric car. Anyway, less of the spiel about the journey and more about the statistics and see how we actually got on. Here we go. Here's the stats for the month of June. And we'll start off a little bit different. Let's talk about water. Using our Anglia water app, which is connected to a smart meter on our mains water supply, we can see we used 4,435 litres of cold water. Now, obviously, when we're heating hot water that's and we're using it, then that's being replaced with cold water. So part of this cold water usage is also our hot water. Looking at our Mixergy tank, the cold water section, it's very interesting to see the cold water side and the temperature of the cold water. So basically this is the mains and how cold the mains water is coming into the uh, tank. And there's a definite difference between April and May and then June and July. Right now it's much warmer, probably about five or six degrees warmer than it was back in March. So it's going to take less energy to heat the hot water up because the cold water is warmer to start with. I've got to say, having a Mixergy hot water tank with all of this data available, it is really useful to see all this stuff. 
onto the hot water section of the Mixergy tank and you can see here there's a huge dip that's where we basically went away for a week on holiday and I didn't have the hot water heated at all so the hot water went cold it went down to zero percent of hot water the temperature reduced right down to 20 degrees but also I made a change during the month I made a change to stop heating our hot water to 54 degrees C when topping it up on solar I changed it and heated it to only 52. So you can see a, a little two different spikes here. The first spike is when we heat it from the grid and that goes up to 54. Then when we heat it back up on solar during the day, it only goes to 52. So I'm using slightly less energy by tweaking that. And the final chart about our hot water, this is the chart that shows how full our hot water tank is. I'm going to have to change the name of that. Current charge doesn't really say exactly that. I'm going to say hot water tank full percent or something. Anyway, you can see there's a large spike uh, in early June where we heated it to 100% and then gradually it comes down. And as I said, we went away on holiday, so it, the hot water percentage went down to zero. But an interesting observation in the data is on the right hand side, we seem to be heating a lot more hot water than normal. And basically we had a guest around for a week. So um, I changed the timers on the eddy and increased the amount of time we're heating hot water overnight. So we had a lot more hot water available for our guest. Again, if you're into data and you like to understand what's going on and look at it from a data perspective, this Mixergy tank and all of the data that's available is excellent. It really helps you understand what's going on. I know I'm a bit of a geek with my data, but if you don't understand your systems and your house and your usage, how can you be efficient? So you need data to understand what's going on. So our hot water usage for the month was 1,459 litres. That's out of the 4,435 litres of cold water we used. 1,459 is actually quite low. It's the lowest this year, so we've done quite well. Hot water-wise, does help going away for a week. Energy-wise, that's 60.6 .6 kilowatt hours to heat the hot water for the month. And I've got to say, without our Mixergy tank, that used to be 90, 100, 110 kilowatt hours a month. So you can see there really is a good energy saving using a smarter, more modern hot water tank. Looking below our Eddy, uh, charging our two electric cars, the Mini and the Kia e Soul, 326.4 kilowatt hours. It's actually one of the highest uh, months of charging our cars we've had. It's nearly 2,000 miles we did this month in the two cars. Most of those done in the Kia e Soul, and as you can see, this is the chart showing the range indicated on the car, so we can see that uh, through Home Assistant looking at the Kia app. And you can see quite a few days there where it's reduced down to less than 50 miles or around 50 miles of range. So that's when we've used the car and come back quite empty. You know, 50 miles range seems empty in the Kia. In the Mini, that's loads. OK, looking at the summary from the My Energy app, it says we generated 1.18 megawatt hours of solar energy, which is a little bit higher than the reality. We consumed a total of 719 kilowatt hours, imported 550 from the grid and consumed solar of 168.5 kilowatt hours, exported 1,013. In reality, we exported 1,035.78 according to the Octopus app. That's a record for us the most we've ever exported. Import through Octopus Energy on our Intelligent Go tariff was 540 kilowatt hours, all at cheap rate, 7.5 pence, no peak rate at all. Converting that to pounds and pence, that's 40 pounds and 48 pence for energy imported and 155 pounds 37 for the energy we exported, our excess solar energy. That gave us a net credit of 114 pounds 89 pence, excluding the standing charge. So even with the standing charge, we're about 100 pounds in credit. So let's just take a moment to let that sink in. That's the whole month's energy nearly 2,000 miles of driving in our electric cars, and we haven't paid anything. In fact, we have been paid over £100. Not bad, eh? Looking at the annual view for our Octopus Energy usage, as 3,490.98 kilowatt hours exported for the first half of the year. And as you can see, every month it's been going up. More sunlight, more solar, which means we're exporting. We're up to 94% of what we generated in solar we've exported this month. 94% of everything generated we're exporting. As the days get shorter and we have less solar energy, that percentage will reduce again. We're quite close to the peak, I think. 
Import for the year is staying lower than the amount we're exporting, so 3,192 kilowatt hours imported. Amazingly, the whole six months, no peak usage at all. That's all at 7.5 pence per kilowatt hour, just the occasional fraction here and there, 0.1 or 0.2 of a kilowatt hour a month. That's all. I saw a video a little while ago. It's a bit of a biased video towards Give Energy, where they were saying that um, all batteries have ramp up and ramp down, so you're always going to have extra peak usage um, while the battery is reacting to loads. Well, that's not strictly true. You need to remember that some battery systems are better at handling ramp up and ramp down than others. So some have a lot of it, some have a lot less. My system, as you can see, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 kilowatt hours for an entire month. It's worth taking a look again at import and export over a longer period of time so we can fully appreciate the change in strategy that we have. You can see here on the right hand side of the chart for import, we're importing a lot more energy over the whole of 2024 than we have in previous years. That's because we're now not self-consuming solar and instead we're importing from the grid at cheap rate. Export has similarly changed as well. We're now exporting a lot more than we have before. So even the peaks in the summer previously, we were only exporting 400, 500, up to 600 kilowatt hours in a month. Now we're well over a megawatt hour, purely because we're trying not to consume our solar. It's more cost effective for us to export it. On to solar then, and this month we had a peak of 7.568 kilowatts of solar generation. That, I think, is pretty much a record for us. And on that day, we generated 52.69 kilowatt hours. So that's the most we've generated so far this year in a single day. Comparing 2024's generation on the right-hand side of this chart to the previous years, it is quite clear that this has been a poor solar year in total. June, though, 1.1 megawatt hours, 1,102 kilowatt hours generated isn't so bad. You know, thankfully, we've got lots of solar panels, so even when it's not perfect, we have enough solar energy. Looking at the June comparison, if we look at the dark blue lines, you can see 550 kilowatt hours for one of our arrays compares. It's not the worst. It's not the best. You know, it was a decent June, but uh, yeah, it's a bit of a middling month. Nothing special. On to some of the detail which really helps people compare their solar arrays to mine. This is our solar edge array. It's a 2 kilowatt inverter with 2.4 kilowatts of panels, 8 panels in total, 313 kilowatt hours for the month. That's pretty good. Again, June is the peak month, so they're going to be quite high. This inverter, 550 kilowatt hours generated, that's our first inverter we installed, the Solus 3.68 kilowatt inverter with 3.9 kilowatts of solar panels on the roof. I think it's 14 and they're 280 watt panels. And finally, this is the third inverter, our second Solus inverter, which covers the panels on our garage roof and also the gable panels that, that we have facing east, 239 kilowatt hours. In total, 1102 kilowatt hours. For comparison purposes, the number of kilowatt hours per kilowatt of solar panels installed, that can be a useful number for comparisons. So our solar edge array that we generate 313 kilowatt hours on, that generated 130.42 kilowatt hours per kilowatt of solar panels installed. A 2.5 kilowatt solace inverter that looks after the gable end panels and also our garage panels, that generated 82.41 kilowatt hours per kilowatt of solar panels installed. Obviously with more shade and less efficient panels, we're generating less per panel. Saving the best to last, our largest inverter, the 3.68 kilowatt Solus inverter, that generated 141.03 kilowatt hours per kilowatt of solar panels installed. So remember that's got 3.9 kilowatts of panels. Did anyone get more than 141 kilowatt hours per kilowatt of solar panels? Let me know in the comments below. Really like to hear that. Not many charts to go now. This one from my energy showing import, self-consumption of solar in green and yellow export. So we've mentioned the numbers before, but pictorially, it's really interesting to see this, to see the proportions of what we're bringing in from the grid and what we're exporting. 
This is one of our Victron charts. I cover this every month because the blue section at the top gives me a good description of what we're doing with our battery. So uh, the right-hand scale is the percentage full of the battery. So if it goes right up to 100%, which you can see it does on half of the days in the month, then we're charging it to 100%. And the lower it comes down that scale, the closer we're getting to using all of the battery. And as you can see on the right-hand side, only a couple of days we went down to 30% where I'm exporting lots of energy from the battery to make more money by exporting energy putting it into the battery at 7.5 pence exporting it for 15 pence but i'm still not exporting the entire battery i'm just increasing it slowly and getting used to the idea of emptying the battery and it won't be long anyway and winter will be here then i won't have that spare energy in the battery to be exported i'll need it for overnight one chart on temperatures, the orange line showing the loft temperature, which is a good indication of what the outside temperature is. You can see around the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th of June, we had a nice dip where it was quite cool, and the lounge temperature actually dropped down um, into a lower temperature. It came close to wanting the heating on, but then temperatures increased. The lounge temperature, which is the blue line, increased back to the comfortable level of 19, 20 degrees. And then we had a bit of a heat wave, didn't we, towards the end of June. And again, our lounge stays the same temperature because we're using air conditioning when it gets hot. I monitor the energy usage of our air conditioning system, our air-to-air -air heating system. I use a Shelly power monitor for that. And you can see here for the month of June, we used 37.2 kilowatt hours, mostly at the end of June. So the last chart showing all of our power usage for all of the things I'm monitoring in Home Assistant, it's a summary really of everything I've covered before. The Zappi is the main culprit, that was what, 326 kilowatt hours. The Eddy was next at 60 kilowatt hours. The Kitchen Sockets, our kitchen usage, is the next high usage with Toshiba Aircon. Energy usage after that, what did I just say, 36, 37 kilowatt hours. Followed by our TV. Yep, that's around 16, 17 kilowatt hours every month. Um, Eddie, solar kilowatt hours. That's already included in the grid number. I'm really not sure why my energy do that, but that shows me how much um, solar energy we were consuming to top up the hot water during the day. Then we've got the main induction hob. That's a separately monitored hob inside our kitchen. And lastly, the internet home assistant hubs and the my energy hub, all of those great things. That's the lowest at around 10, 12 kilowatt hours a month. One day, maybe I'll rewire the consumer unit, you know, not myself, um, but have that done so I can monitor all of our lighting circuits as well and our upstairs sockets. So, uh, yeah, we're not monitoring every single thing. There's lots of smart sockets uh, listed below, like the guest heater, dehumidifier, the bathroom, cloakroom, second fridge, ensuite, cloakroom and laundry. All of those things are monitored with smart plugs, but those items are used more in the winter. So no usage for any of those this month. As always, thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. Lots of statistics there and uh, great information. I hope it encourages you to join me on this electric journey. See you again soon for more videos soon. Bye for now.